Good evening, everyone. Welcome. For those of you who are new here, um, I don't know if you got it the way the introduction went, but this is planned that once a month uh, I give the, the, the Dharma talk. So it's not that uh, it was a mistake that nobody's here, but mm -hmm. this is a planned event. Um, of course, every um, Every month is different. You know, it's an interesting thing having to come up with a topic every month. There's really very little to say about Zen Buddhism. Uh, there are many books written, but you repeat the same thing over and over again. Um, so I decided this week, Paul in his introduction mentioned that I'm a psychotherapist. And next week I'm flying to Maine to... Um, to do a training for psychotherapists. And the training is essentially about Zen and psychotherapy, how they interconnect and how you can use Zen Buddhism and um, Buddhist teachings to inform one's psychotherapy practice. So this will be a training for psychotherapists. And as fitting for Zen, one day of it will be somewhat experiential but more teaching, and the second day will actually be a meditation retreat. And in the meditation retreat, you can, one can experience for oneself what it's like. So those of you who are new here, I don't know if you have meditation experience or not, but you got a small taste. 25 minute taste of sitting down, following your breath, and opening up to whatever it is that you're experiencing in the moment that you're in. And in many ways, that's, that's Zen, that's Buddhism in a nutshell. To have the capacity to hold your experience, not to run away from your experience, not to add anything to your experience of explanation or analysis, just to experience what you're experiencing. Of course, there's plenty of room for understanding and analysis, and our human minds gravitate towards doing that. But nobody needs to teach you how to do that. That's what we naturally, I don't know if it's natural, but that's our usual way as human beings. We have an experience, we either like that experience, or we don't like that experience, or sometimes we're neutral about the experience. But if you're honest, neutrality is a tough, unusual circumstance. Usually, we like something, or we don't like something. And what the Buddha taught was that Suffering is the, it's the way of human beings. The first noble truth that the Buddha taught was, it's as many ways to say it, often it's said is life is suffering. But that doesn't mean that suffering is all there is. It means that our lives are imbued with suffering. We don't escape suffering because we either want what we don't have, or we don't want what we do have, or we have what we want, but we're afraid we're going to lose it. So we tighten up around those things that we have. So in Buddhist, Buddhist terminology, there's greed and there's aversion. And basically said, greed and aversion and the delusion that comes from greed and delusion create the suffering in our lives. So everybody understands greed. I'll tell you a little story about my greed. I was at Trader Joe's about a month ago, and I needed to buy bananas. Now usually when you go to the supermarket and you buy bananas, you pay by the pound. But at Trader Joe's, they charge you by the banana. And I went in, and I needed, I needed a couple of bananas. And I'm looking at these bananas, and I'm thinking, 
usually, prefaces, usually I buy small bananas because I mix them into my fruit salad and I don't want too much bananas. So I, but there I am at Trader Joe's and they sell them by the banana. And I'm thinking, if I buy these small bananas, I'm getting cheated because a big banana and a small banana is the same price. We're talking 17 cents. But that was enough. So I bought the big bananas. And I got them home and I started laughing because I didn't even need the big bananas. But my greed just kicked in. And as I'm sitting and standing there at Trader Joe's over the bananas, I'm recognizing I don't even want the big banana. But I couldn't buy the small banana. I bought the big banana. That's greed. It's a small, simple example. But you can see that these things happen a hundred times a day. That's my greed. You may sit there thinking, well, that's stupid. I would never do that. This guy's calling himself a Zen master, but he's greedy. What's he doing that for? I would never do that, and maybe you wouldn't. But pay attention to your life, and you'll find your greed. That desire, that grasping after things, creates this incredible distraction and barrier between the moment and ourselves. Because our greed and our aversion make us want to control and create a very particular kind of experience. The truth of the matter is, it's very rare for us to have the exact experience that we want. <laughs> so we suffer. We're constantly trying to create something that we can't have. That's human life. So that's what the Buddha means when it says life is suffering. It's not that life is inherently suffering. It's just that our consciousnesses, consciousness, yeah, plurals of consciousness, are programmed to go after, to try to shape the world in an image that we think is the way the world should be. And we're always coming up short. And like I said, there are moments where we get it. And then we want it again. We become greedy for the thing that we want. When I first moved to California back in 1975, I moved on to this beautiful, beautiful Zen community in, uh, just outside of the town of Mendocino. I was a suburban boy from New York and I went to school in the city in Washington, D.C., and somehow or other, I landed in this magnificent redwood forest with these hand-built buildings, houses really, that housed us. I had never in my life experienced something so beautiful. I'd been in the countryside, I'd gone to summer camp, but nothing like this. It was the the... My dream was realized. I didn't even know what I wanted, but being there was just incredible. I was learning to practice then. I was meeting people, I was having experiences, and I was in this incredible community. And I remember saying to somebody, this is so incredibly great, except for the mosquitoes. <laughs> So I don't know, I'm dating myself, but watching Saturday Night Live, there was a character, Rosanna, Rosanna Dana, who her line was, it's always something. It's always something. And that's what happens to us. There's always something. And that something destroys the moment that we're in. That's the predicament of our, li predicament of our lives. The Buddha recognized this, and the Buddha said there's a way out of this suffering. He didn't say it exactly in this way, but it's so incredibly easy to say and so incredibly hard to do, and that's to accept things as they are, to be in the moment and fully 
and completely embrace what is. That includes what we like, but here's the rub, it includes what we don't like. So, we're left with having to find a way to be completely with the moment that is. Of course, we're always acting in the moment, but we're also having to accept the reality of the circumstance that we find ourselves in. And these practices that we experience tonight, our chanting practice, the, the sitting practice that we did, certainly the sitting practice is, is foremost. You know, the word Zen literally translates meditation. So when you call it Zen Buddhism, you're really saying meditation Buddhism. So it's the kind of meditation that uses sitting meditation to understand ourselves. So I said I'm going to Maine and I'm doing this training for psychotherapists. How does Zen impact your job, your role as a psychotherapist? What does Zen have to offer for the very practical job of helping to alleviate suffering. Because, of course, people come to psychotherapy because they're suffering. Nobody's going to pay the kind of money you have to pay to go to psychotherapy unless you're suffering and you don't know how to deal with your suffering. And you're going to someone to help you learn to deal with your suffering. Of course, that's why we come to a Zen center. There's no difference. So, what I want to talk a little bit about now are some of the really practical applications to sitting meditation. And it's my sense and my experience that there's one aspect of meditation, which is sitting here in the meditation hall, sitting for 25 minutes, doing it in a formal way, and using that experience to gain wisdom and insight and compassion. So, those of you who are here for the first time, what I'm saying is that we have a very formal practice that we do to, in a sense, put us into a bit of a pressure cooker. Face the things that we're usually trying to avoid. And one of the ways I like to talk about meditation is that meditation is a process that helps us make the container of our consciousness big enough and, I think, strong enough to hold our experience, to not have to run away, to be able to be unhappy or afraid or sad or frustrated or angry and not have to do something to change the situation, but at least at first, to be able to face the reality of the situation as it is right in this moment. You can simply say to be able to sit with it, to be with the moment. And I work with many, many people in psychotherapy, and almost everybody comes in, and there's something about what they're going through that they can't handle. So what happens is when they're faced with that experience, Rather than sit and be with it, they do something to, to divert the energy. There's a phrase in psychotherapy, and I'm sure just about everybody has heard this phrase, and the phrase is acting out. And what that means is you have a feeling, but you can't stand it. So out of that feeling, you do something trying to make it better. And maybe in that moment, it does make it better. But what you're also doing when you do that is you're creating more and more of a false self. We create these strategies and personalities and ways of being to try to fool things or protect ourselves from the experience. And though it may work in the very moment that we're in, 
we end up getting more and more distant from something natural and organic of ourselves. So in Zen we would say, we lose our true self and we create this false self, or sometimes it's called a small self, in order to buffer the experience that we're in. So we have this very simple process of sitting down, breathing in, and breathing out. A little bit differently than the way Paul described meditation practice tonight, we can say, we breathe in and we ask this question, which in Buddhism is called the great question, what am I? See, we're so lost from ourselves that we don't even know who we are. So we ask really an unanswerable question, what am I? And we respond with not knowing. And that not knowing opens us up to the moment. It's our knowing or trying to shape what we know that actually closes us down and creates this falseness that permeates our, our, our societies, our cultures. In a, in a sense, we end up walking around like ghosts, or maybe a better word for it would be a shell. We present, the, we present this artifice to the world, but inside there's an inkling that there's something else there. You ever notice when you read a novel that there'll be, um, you'll hear the character's inner thoughts about something, and then there's a line of dialogue which is exactly the opposite of what the person's feeling. Inside they're feeling, I hate you. And out come the words, I love you. And you wonder why we don't trust each other. Why we think, really? Can I trust what you're saying? On some levels, we can't. Because we're each hiding behind this artifice to protect something. So Zen Buddhism, Zen practice, it's about going, looking inward and finding that thing we're trying to protect and sitting with it and allowing that experience to be present. That's all theoretical. It's not really theoretical, it's what we actually do here. I can talk about it, and it's a theory, but we have these practices in this meditation hall to help us actually do it. For those of us who are Zen students, we come week after week, month after month, year after year, and we keep looking, we keep asking that great question. This coming weekend, we're having a three-day meditation retreat where many of us will be sitting in this room for all day, really. I mean, there are breaks, there's a schedule to it, so it's not like we're sitting meditation for 24 hours. But from six in the morning till 9.30 at night, our day will be structured. And the heart of that structured day is 13 half hour periods of meditation. And the, the, the blocks of meditation are 30 minutes sitting, 10 minutes walking, 30 minutes sitting, 10 minutes walking, 30 minutes sitting, and then a couple of times the block ends, and a couple of times it goes on for one more sitting of 30 minutes just sitting with ourselves, trying to get comfortable with the reality of what our experience actually is. And it can be brutal sometimes, because there's a reason we move away from that experience. And we have to, in a sense, fight the tendency to jump away. I'm not sure I was paying attention closely enough when Paul was giving his meditation instruction today, I don't know if he said it actually, but generally he says, practice is about returning to your experience. And maybe a hundred times in just those 25 minutes, we jump into the story and get lost in the story. But Zen practice is about coming back to the breath 
coming back to the question, returning to the moment. Return, 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 return. So, for anybody, whether you sit for hours in the Dharma room, or just use the breath as a tool to return, we can learn to find our way back to our experience. So, in our daily life, we're often met with situations we don't like. And generally what happens is we freak out. And we start spinning out of control. Some people get anxious. Some people get really jittery. Some people jump up and down. Some people get angry. Some people withdraw. Everybody has their own technique to, for dealing with a situation that feels too much. So your first job is to discover what are your techniques? What do you do when you can't handle it? What do you do when the situation that presents itself feels like it's too much? So you start to get familiar with yourself and you notice I'm gone. Then you need a way to return. So just what we did tonight, those 25 minutes of breathing in, breathing out, you can use that in your everyday life when you lose yourself. So once you know that you've lost yourself, come back to your breath. I often tell people, take 10 deep breaths. Slow and steady. The research done in the 70s found that biologically, or that our own bio, our own biology, six to 10 breaths a minute is a relaxed state of breathing. And very often when we start to lose ourselves, our breath speeds up. It comes <laughs> like a dog. So slow your breath down. Take 10 breaths. Breathe in slowly. Breathe out slowly. And again, in and out. Nobody has to know you're doing this. You could be on the phone flipping out because the customer support person is not giving you what you want. Or they're speaking with an accent that you don't understand. And I don't know about you, but I know the frustration level can go up and up and up. First thing, become aware that your frustration level is going up. And then breathe. And if you breathe, you can bring your energy in. When Paul was describing the breath that we use in Zen practice, it's, it's centered in the lower abdomen. When you breathe into your lower abdomen, you're bringing your energy down. Usually we're stuck here, or if we're going through some strong emotional experience, we get stuck here. And our consciousness and our breathing is up here. But if we can bring our energy and our attention down to the lower abdomen, the Chinese and the Koreans call this the Tanjen. Literally translates energy garden. The Japanese call it the Hara, or the center. It's about maybe an inch to two inches below your navel. That's why when we sit in meditation and our hands are in this mudra, we're actually encircling that har, that tanjen. So we breathe in and we breathe out. Whether your hands are there or not, you bring the energy down. That's your center of gravity. That's the place that if you develop the strength of your center, you can hold the situation. You don't have to run away. You don't have to act out of it. You can be with it. 
And you can use your breath day in and day out in a very informal way to keep yourself in contact with your center. But when you're, what I'm saying, when you're freaking out and your energy is rising, you can bring the energy down in a way that helps ground you and bring you back to yourself. And by coming back to yourself, you're better able to actually deal with the situation that's right in front of you. You might cry, you might laugh, you might be afraid, but as our center becomes stronger, we can hold it. And we can find a way to act with whatever the energy is in this moment and work with it and find a way through it. Rather than being tossed around by it, we can stay grounded and centered and work with it. Of course, the introduction takes a lot longer than I expected. I got through one, one note here that I have. <laughs> Another thing that breath helps you with is return to the moment that we're actually in. When we lose ourselves, we lose contact with the moment. Breathing can bring us back to the moment, and ironically, not always, but often, the moment is actually less frightening and less difficult than the, the, the tumult and the fallout that we create by losing the moment. Dennis, you're nodding, you understand this very well. Actually, dealing with the situation is more simple, more direct, and more rewarding than leaving the moment. But we're so conditioned not to believe that, that we lose it. So just remembering to return to what's actually happening. Sometimes you have to check in with your body as a way of returning to the moment. Again, the breath gives you an anchor, gives you a way to return. Especially when anxiety grows, we, we leave the moment more and more. So just feeling the anxiety in the chest, just feeling that rumbling in the belly, just being aware of what's going on in your mind, helps you come back to the moment. There's a phrase in Zen Buddhism, it's, you make, you get. We create so much of the drama that we experience, and then we blame it on somebody else or something else. But as we get more familiar with our experience, we can own what it is that we create. And then we can realize that we have some choice. What we create, what we make, is what we get. So if we can come back to the moment and act from a place of groundedness, a place of love, compassion, empathy, and also the wisdom of being in the moment, we create a much different world for ourselves and others than the ones we have. All the defensiveness, the greediness, the I need, I'm our teacher, I can hear him say, I, me, mine. As much as we're centered in for me, that means we're ripping off everybody else because I'm the most important thing around. So it's no wonder that we live very competitively. We don't trust others because in some ways we're not trustworthy ourselves. Returning to ourselves, returning to the moment, using our breath just to come back. Now these things are very easy to say and they're much more difficult to do in these moments of discomfort. So the more we learn to be with our discomfort and not have to run away from it, 
the more capable we are to be present in the moment. I think what I'll do is stop the talk here. And we've got about 15 more minutes, so if there's any questions or anything that someone would like me to talk about, I'd be happy to do that. And if somebody in the back could raise the lights a little bit, I think that would be helpful. Just turn the lights up all the way. Yes, sir. Oh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I'd like to share an experience, and, and I'm curious what you would have to say. So, under your guidance, I've been trying hard to be mindful of my life, of my mind in that life. And what is pretty evident is that I have all sorts of sub-personalities. You know, the self is actually a collection of right. junk. That's, that's a great insight, right there. Recognizing that when we think of, I'm sorry for interrupting your story, don't forget it. But we, we mistake, we mistakenly think I am one thing. But the insight that you have that really I'm a whole series of personalities, of eyes. There's not just one eye. There's a multitude of eyes all kind of competing for prominence or to get satisfied. And those conflicts in and of themselves create a lot of the suffering that, that exists in our life. Please. So some of those sub-personalities or sub-eyes turn out to be real jerks by any imaginable human standard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that would be all right, but some of them are very strong to the point where I feel that I'm like at war with this guy or that guy. I mean that, sub, that personality? Sub right, yeah. right. You know, like something like it takes over me at times. And wants me to be uncaring, manipulative, all sorts of bad stuff. Mm -hmm. So how do you deal with that? Return to your center. This is the place that you can unify all those different warring parts. Breathe. Come back to your center. You have to directly deal with that conflict. First thing is Return to here will help you not act out that manipulative self. You can feel it. It can exist. But we need a way to not just, you know how kids, they feel? They do. There's no consciousness. There's no awareness. You know, a lot of people I work with mistake anger and the expression of anger. We think they're the same thing, but they're not. And people will say to me, I can't control my anger. And I say, I don't believe you. I say, what do you mean you don't believe me? I say, well, when's the last time you punched somebody in the nose? You might want to punch them in the nose, but there's something that draws the line. People don't go around killing each other. Fortunately, it's rare and even more fortunately in our culture, it seems to be getting rarer. But there's plenty of times we want to kill somebody. So there is something that draws the line. Return to your center. Use your center as a way of being angry without acting angry. Anger is a lot of energy. People think, I've got to get rid of my anger because the anger is so destructive. But that will kill your vitality. Better hold the energy and use that energy to come alive, but not to, be, to punch somebody in the nose, so that you can be alive, bring your vitality to the moment that you're in. Bring the energy here. That's how you work with it. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Please. Thank you for your talk. Um, you were talking about being with your feelings, and so two things came up for me. One is, what about when the uh, experience you're in in the moment is too intense, such as physical pain? 
Mm -hmm. um, and the other is the resentment. So a lot of times the situation as it is brings up for me, you know, really intense feelings of feeling angry at the universe or life or my situation for, you know, certain things that I don't feel should exist. So mm -hmm. maybe you can speak about those. Too. Yeah, thank you. I think it it touches right back to this making your center stronger. My teacher used to take his stick and he used to poke us right in that tangent. And he'd say, make your center stronger, stronger, stronger. And what that means is you can contain the energy, even pain. How do you hold the pain? And a strong center doesn't mean a rigid center. The image is more I don't know if they still have them. When I was a kid, I had a punching bag. And it's like, I think it was Casper the Ghost. And you punch it, and it falls over. But it's weighted on the bottom, so it comes right back up. That's what a strong center is. It's not that you don't get moved, but you come back. So that you develop the capacity to hold the energy. When that resentment starts to grow, you want to do something to change it so you don't feel resentful anymore. But very often that just makes the situation worse. So hold the energy. Contain it. Make, let yourself be able to train yourself to be able to hold it and not turn away from it. And that will change everything. I can almost guarantee it that the more you're able to hold it and not have to make it different, the better able you will be to work with it and find a way through the situation that actually works and, and creates less suffering and less pain in the world. It's actually, many people have heard me talk, hear me say this over and over again, it's actually the path to world peace. World peace doesn't come from the government doing something. Peace comes when we treat each other with love, compassion, and respect. But we can't do that when we can't hold the negative energies in ourselves. So we have to find a way to hold them and not turn away. So it's not about not being resentful. It's about recognizing that feeling of resentment and, and not turning away from yourself. It's almost counterintuitive. We think if I just get rid of this feeling, then it will be more peaceful. But in getting rid of first of all, we can't really get rid of the feeling. My experience is when we try to do that, we deaden ourselves. And that's just going to breed more resentment, not less. Touch what you're asking. Thank you. You're very welcome. Anybody else? Question? Dennis? Yeah, you, you spoke about uh, slowing down the breath. <clears throat> I'm having some body sensations lately where it's almost impossible for me to breathe. Mm -hmm. I just almost have to consciously force myself to breathe. Although, of course, that's not true. Because yeah. if you stop breathing, you'll yeah. be dead. Right. But figuratively, yeah, I understand. That's, that's, that's what it feels like, like. yes. And? And, um, just wanted to know if there was a, a well, um, how, how I can work with my breath in those situations. Do it. <coughs> You're going to be sitting here for three days and your body is going to go through all these sensations. And what I would really encourage, welcome that. Don't try, you know, you can use a retreat to think, oh great, I'll get, I'll, I won't have to deal with that for three days. But you, you okay, you, you, you don't have a choice. So you're going to be your own scientist. You have in your mind Jeff says, work with your breath. I can't even find my breath. So the first thing you'll have to do is try to find your breath. It may take all of Friday. You may not get past that first question. 
a whole retreat. Probably they're going to be all different kinds of moments. But I think as you just work with it, and then you'll come in and talk to me and we'll work with it together, you'll find your way. It's your body. It's your experience. I kind of understand what you're saying, but nothing like you understand it. So be a good scientist. A good scientist is actually a good Zen student because the scientific method is using the mind that doesn't know to investigate the moment. You're a terrible scientist if you let your opinions, your ideas, and the way you want the experiment to work out, if you let that determine your results, you're lost. You've got tainted data and your conclusions are wrong. But if you keep this not knowing mind and you just stay with it, you will see the truth of your own experience. So just hang in there and be willing to be wrong, be willing to make mistakes, be willing to be frustrated. Uh, see, again, easy to say, hard to do, I understand that. But this weekend, we're going to have this wonderful contained experience. There's nowhere to go. And you're, you're, you're supported in this group of people sitting with you, but nobody's going to meddle in your own business. You're going to get to just sit there and work with your own experience. That's the, the, the beautiful blessing of a meditation retreat that doesn't get talked about a lot. You're supported in a group, and you're on your own at the same time. You're free to explore because the container will support you. So use it. <laughs>